Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm joined today by my good friend Linda Chavez, a longtime friend. We served together. You at a higher level, of course, in the <laughs> Reagan administration um, and various political fights over the years. And you've been engaged in the immigration fight, our topic for today, for a long, long time. I think your first book was, what, 1991? Correct. And it was called... What was it called? Out of the Barrio Toward a New Politics of Hispanic Assimilation. Very controversial title at the time. Is that right? Yes. People were against Hispanic assimilation? Liberals were against Hispanic assimilation. Conservatives were uh, heartened by the data that I presented that showed that Hispanics were assimilating. Now, of course, conservatives believe they never will assimilate. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So you, I mean, you've been in this fight a long time. It's, one of the, it's become one of the nastiest fights in Washington or in American politics, really, right? It and is. It, it's a very strange phenomenon because my position has been absolutely steady since the 1970s. I was always pro-legal immigration. I always believed that we should have a balance of immigrants coming in from different places with different skills levels, uh, but that once they got here, everybody had to learn English, and the goal was that they would become U.S. citizens eventually, and certainly that their children uh, would embrace America and the American ideal. And a lot of my early work and early research was to show that it, that indeed was happening, that it was happening with this generation of Hispanics, just as it had with Italians, Jews, Poles, and others in the 20th century, Germans and Irish in the 19th century, uh, going back really to uh, the founding of our nation. And that holds up? It does hold up. You know, it's interesting. People are so alarmed about, you know, the country splitting apart into all these ethnic and cultural groups and so forth. And I think that it, and what's remarkable to me is that for a time in the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, liberals were very focused on making America multicultural. We weren't going to have an American culture. We didn't need a single language. Uh, everybody could come here, stay in their own little enclave, speak their own language, continue their own cultural practices, and that was the liberal ideal. Um, in fact, it doesn't work. It has never worked in the United States, even when people have tried to maintain their language. The Germans, when they came in the 19th century, for example, they wanted their own state. And in fact, they petitioned Congress. It didn't ever really work out, but they wanted the state of, I think it was Wisconsin, uh, to be a German language state. That was going to be their own little enclave here. They had German language schools, public schools, funded with public money, yeah. uh, such as it was during uh, the 19th century, uh, that taught German as the first language. And yet today, uh, German Americans are probably still our largest right. ethnic group. Um, but what German Americans of the second, third, or fourth, fifth generation speak German today? None. Right. Intermarriage turns out to do That's a lot right. of, so to be a pretty powerful solvent. Anyway, so the conservative, well, let's just go through the different concern, uh, concerns perhaps of today. I mean. Uh, the cultural, I mean, how seriously are, how are we going to look like Europe with you know, minority communities that just don't assimilate and are sources of crime at best and terror at worst and so forth? I do think that's, don't you think that's been a fairly large part, the, the, the European, the photos? The fear. The fear. Right. Uh, and certainly that's been true as Europe has had a flood of refugees going in, many of them uh, from non-Western countries, many of them from the Middle East and from Africa. Uh, and so there is that sense. Uh, but Actually, Europe is not very good at assimilating people, but the United States is. And the real question today in a lot of conservatives' minds, they, they go into stores and they have to push the button for, you know, or they go to the bank, you know, English or Spanish or right. other languages that irritates people. Uh, they see Spanish language signs, they see speak, uh, hear people speaking Spanish, and so they assume, well, they're never going to assimilate they're not going to become Americans. My grandparents came from Italy, and they became Americans, but these newcomers from Mexico or Guatemala or El Salvador, they're never going to become Americans. Well, it turns out that that's just simply not right. And I've done a lot of research, some original research back in the early 1990s that showed the progression. And lots of other people have followed uh, doing extensive research about assimilation. And it turns out Hispanics uh, are actually integrating, assimilating at a faster rate than some of the immigrants of earlier generations. And part of that is we have a mass popular culture. We have television, films, music that gets people quickly speaking English. Um, and because the left has sort of backed off some of its multicultural fascination from the uh, earlier era. 
Uh, they finally realize that people are not going to be enthusiastic about welcoming newcomers if they don't think they're going to become Americans. So the left has backed off a little, and we no longer hear calls for you know a bilingual America. I, I can remember, you know, in previous uh, times when people would point to Canada. Well, it works in Canada, not not really. It doesn't work right. all that well there either. Uh, but it 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 doesn't work here. And while people will retain Spanish in the first generation, um, what we see with Hispanics is that by the second generation, it's something like 97% of second generation Hispanics are perfectly fluent in English. Uh, for the younger population, they're not only fluent in English, that's their preferred language. Um, they get their news in English. Um, and they're moving up the economic ladder and into the middle class uh, mainstream uh, as quickly as any generation before them. So we sh so it's not, I mean, the, the concern that seems a little more sophisticated is, you know, those years, we're not against immigrants, but so many from one place, from a neighboring country, in certain parts of the country that are close to that neighboring country, it's a different dynamic than people coming 3,000 miles from Germany or Italy, there's some truth to that probably, and therefore it's harder to assimilate them, they stay more in their own communities, it's more divisive for the country. Etc. Well, actually, there is a little bit of uh, merit in that argument. Uh, but what people don't know is that when the Italians came here, a third of them went back to Italy. Uh, so it may have been hard to get here, but they, those who did not, in fact, do well, ended up going home. Um, and we used to have that kind of back and flow, uh, back, uh, back and forth uh, flow in the United States as well with uh, Mexico and, and Latin America. Uh, certainly for illegal immigrants, it used to be common in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, on up until fairly recently that people would cross illegally, come here, do seasonal work. Their families would stay at home, it was men, and then they would go uh, back home and spend the winter months or whatever uh, with their families in Latin America. What happened, though, is because of fears of terrorism and the clampdown uh, on border security, we've been actually very successful at keeping people out. We have uh, less than a third of the illegal immigrants coming into the, trying to come into the United States today as we had uh, uh, even 20 years ago. So, uh, Is that right? So. Yeah, we're, we're at historic lows. We are back at the levels of illegal immigration that we saw in the 1970s. It's almost So we have, what, 10, level. 11 million? You always hear these numbers. It's about 11, a little over 11 million people who are here illegally. That number has remained uh, pretty constant for 10, 15 years now. And, and they're mostly the same people year to year? Mostly the same people from year to year. Uh, some people go home and some people come in. Uh, interestingly, Mexican immigration, Mexico was always our leading source of immigration in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, the numbers there are actually declining, both legal and illegal. There are actually more Mexicans either leaving or dying in the United States than there are newcomers coming in to replace them. So we've seen a very slight decline in the Mexican-born population. But the numbers are, are relatively low. So so let's look at the illegal, since that's so mm -hmm. much of the debate. You know, I mean, I will, we'll get to legal, which is actually very important too. But so, of what is the illegal immigration problem? There, the one problem is there's just 11 million people who are here illegally, which is problematic in all kinds of, I guess, obvious ways. But the actual number coming in is not that great. It's not that saying. great. It's about 300,000. It hovers around 300,000 and has for the last few years. And some are leaving too. And some are leaving. That's right. And in a country of 330 million, presumably this is not. Yeah, it's not a huge problem. Uh, so there, what, there what are, to do about that problem? What well, it, you know, I do think um, that we need to do something about that problem. I have a quick fix. We could fix the illegal immigration uh, tomorrow if we would pass sensible legal immigration reform that allowed people that are having to come illegally to come legally. And who are those people? They are uh, tr uh, largely low-skilled. Uh, they're coming to do jobs that most Americans shun. Uh, we're talking about you know picking fruits and vegetables. We're talking about working on poultry and other meat processing lines, cleaning commercial buildings, uh, making beds in hotels. Uh, these tend to be low wage, low skill jobs. And for most Americans who have much more education than Americans used to, um, these are not jobs they want. They don't want them for themselves. They certainly don't want them for their children. So. You know, we can mechanize some of those jobs. That's not necessarily going to help Americans who think that 
Mexicans are stealing their jobs. Right. A machine replacing them is you know, no better than a Mexican replacing them. Uh, but uh, some of the jobs can't be replaced. I mean, the only thing that could happen is you could see the industry move elsewhere. And we've seen that even in, in the meat processing uh, area. Uh, I used to be on the board of the largest chicken uh, processing company in the in the country and uh, when we had raids as we did even though we followed all the rules we went you know we were one of the first companies to have uh, e-verify which required that you know you um, have a very close check on people's credentials even with that, uh, we were raided. We lost 400 workers. Uh, when that happened, the company had tremendous problems. They couldn't find Americans to replace them. And even when they were able to, people didn't stay on the job. So what do you do in that situation? Well, in this case, the company went bankrupt. It got bought by a Brazilian operation. And some of those uh, jobs get shipped overseas. You know, you can raise chickens on one side of the border or the other. It's just as easy to raise them in Mexico as in, as in Texas. And so uh, the idea that, you know, we can stop people from coming and, and we don't need these jobs filled, those people do provide some benefit here. They do live in communities, pay taxes in those communities. Everybody pays. Uh, sales tax, everybody pays uh, property tax, whether through rent or through uh, owning. And so, you know, we can see communities hollowed out because those workers aren't there anymore, but I don't know who that benefits. And their kids are, because of birthright citizenship, will tend to be American if they're here when they're of childbearing age, which I guess not all of them are, and some of them are just men and so forth. But yeah, no, they will. Be, um, so those we do, are the DACA kid, the yeah. kids, right? I mean, well, and and we do have the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution, which says that anyone born in the United States um, and subject to this uh, jurisdiction thereof is a citizen of the United States, and that was a very hard fought, fought battle in the Fourteenth uh, in the Nineteenth Century for that Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, we see assaults on that now. We see some people suggesting that the Fourteenth Amendment doesn't mean what it says in plain English, uh, that the historical debates that took place don't mean what they said, um, and they're basically trying to uh, push the current administration to uh, take away that birthright citizenship. There are even proposals that um, they'd like to see it done by executive order. Um, I think that would be challenged, and I think it would fail in the Supreme Court. But yeah, uh, people who come here illegally set down roots. Uh, the average illegal immigrant to the United States has lived here uh, well over a decade. Uh, there are about four and a half million children born uh, to illegal immigrants in the United States. And as you say, they are U.S. citizens. Uh, but the real question is, what's, how are they doing? How, how is the second generation yeah, okay. doing? Okay. Well, how are they doing? Yeah. Oh, well, so these are different from the the so-called DACA kids. So yeah, those, the DACA kids came as children so illegally. They're not citizens. They're so not they were citizens. Brought by That's exactly right. Parents. Um, although they're doing very well, uh, okay, they're well, employed. Let's go through each of these. Yeah. So categories. we'll go for, yeah. first. We'll go through the kids, the second generation uh, immigrants, whether born to parents who came illegally or legally. Second generation Hispanics um, are moving up the ec economic ladder. They actually do better than um, uh, Hispanics in the United States who trace their heritage back more generations. Uh, that's sort of true of most second generation immigrants. Um, the parents struggle very hard, make it, and then the kids do really well. Uh, but it's true of Hispanics as well as uh, anyone else. I mean, there was a recent study by the Cato Institute that showed Central American second generation actually uh, slightly exceed uh, U.S. born uh, Americans in college graduation rates. That's stunning. And these are kids of both legal and, and illegal. illegal. Right. Is there much difference between the kids of legal and illegal? Uh, you know, I don't think they broke it down. I think that's hard to figure out. Um, but um, I, I would expect that you're a little more likely to do well if your parents are legal because you're going to have access to, right. you know, uh, they're going to have access to better jobs. So, no crisis of illegal immigration, in your view? There is no crisis, in my view. Um, it is a problem that needs fixing. We do need secure borders. 
Yeah. Uh, and people I'm are not, jumping the line, which yeah. is unfair in some way. And well, except this myth of the line. There really is no line. If you're from a country like Mexico and you want to immigrate to the United States legally, unless you're an astrophysicist or you know some somebody with very exceptional uh, background, it's going to take you 20 years. So you start at the age of 20, 21, 22. You're a middle-aged person before you're actually yeah. your number comes up. Uh, that's part of the problem. While we don't have quotas anymore for countries, we do have ceiling uh, caps on the number of people that can be admitted and given a green card uh, from from any one country. And for countries like India, China, Mexico, those lines are very, very long. I, mean, I guess one argument also is that if you let, if you keep normalizing different waves of illegal immigrants, you know, you're just inviting more. It's sort of the story of the 86 Act, allegedly at least the cons conservative narrative is it was a failure because we gave amnesty once and then it just sent the signal that we're going to give amnesty the next time. And, well, I think it was a failure, but for a different reason. I think the whole idea of trying to make employers adjuncts to the Border Patrol uh, is a crazy idea. Uh, what people thought in 86 is if we could simply cut off the spigot of jobs, that then illegal immigration would dry up. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's very difficult when you're, as I say, you know, I was on the board of a chicken company. When Americans aren't applying for those jobs, you have a company that you want to keep in business. Um, and even if you follow the steps that the government put in place, chances are people are going to come up with uh, phony IDs and get those jobs. And in fact, that's what the 86 law did. It created a new uh, industry of making phony social security cards, documentation, so that you could go and, and produce it for a prospective employer. And so the whole identity theft uh, area really was an outcome, uh, I believe, of the 1986 law. And I just think there are better ways. I do think we need a way to let workers come on a not necessarily permanent basis, on a temporary basis. Uh, and a lot of the people who are coming illegally would choose to do that if they could. If they could come and work nine, ten months a year, go home, be with their families, not start families here, um, so you would not have the, uh, the situation with, that causes people so much concern, birthright citizenship, um, that would be one way of fixing it. And uh, yet, the people who are most opposed to illegal immigration are also the people most opposed to legal immigration. They simply want to cut the size of the U.S. population. Uh, the whole anti-immigration movement of uh, the late 20th, early 21st century has been uh, started by people who were interested in population control. That's their main concern. They want an America that's smaller. Um, they'd like to see an America that is culturally uh, more similar to the America of the 18th century than of the 21st century. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's their aim in coming up with their proposals. I guess the more reasonable versions of them, or at least the reasonable arguments some of them might use, uh, is, well, we're not for you know, fundamentally getting rid of, you know, stopping it, but maybe a pause. We've ha we have a lot. I mean, is it true that we do have a lot of foreign-born people in the United States right, right now, historically. We do six, about 60 million. So 20% of the mm -hmm. country is. Right. And, and that's, that's historically high. pretty that's high. pretty high. Yeah. And is that a problem? I mean, should people, should we have a slowdown and a pause so that gradually goes down to, you know, from 20% to 15% or something? I don't know. Where, uh, I don't know. What they, is it? Uh, in, in the, you know, beginning of the country, 18th century, we probably had an even higher number right. of people coming in. So, you know, the, the idea that there is some magical number, the real question is, do we assimilate people? Do they learn English? Do they move into the mainstream? Do they contribute? Uh, and do they make America great? I think they do. And so uh, I'm not sure that government is very good at setting numbers of how many people should come. And frankly, um, as I say, Mexico is slowing down. Uh, much of the push that's coming from uh, places like Mexico in the past was, was born out of high pop, uh, very high population growth, high birth rates there, uh, little opportunity. So if there's more opportunity in the home country, if birth rates uh, decline, we're likely to see less anyway. I think the free market actually does a pretty good job of giving us the immigration we need. What about this? Well, let's just talk about the economics then for a minute. There is a reasonable argument that you let in an awful lot more lower-skilled people. It will put downward pressure on wages, and so we are disadvantaging 
less well-educated Americans just because we're creating a greater supply of labor for employers like the company you were on the board mm -hmm. of to, to choose among. Is there truth in that? A little bit of truth in that. Uh, George Borjas at Harvard has done a lot of work on that. Uh, there is some downward pressure on wages. But interestingly, the group that it affects most are older immigrants, people who came in an earlier wave, uh, not necessarily U.S.-born uh, workers. Uh, and the downward mobility, or the downward pressure, rather, on wages is pretty minimal. It's, it's, it's not significant. Um, what w studies of the impact of immigrants in terms of the overall economy shows that they're actually a net positive. Um, and certainly their children are net positive. So, um, you know, as in every generation, whether you're talking about the Irish of the 19th century or the Jews of the early 20th century or the Mexicans uh, of today, uh, it was not the first generation that succeeded that well. It was their kids. And every indication is these kids are succeeding too. Yeah, I guess that is one problem with these economic studies. I'm struck by that. If you take a snapshot, right. of course, by definition, almost you're going to have Muddy, you know, you may not have great results about right. people who've just been here three just months got here, right. they just or got five here, years. Right. Or, right. And right. as you say, some of them who don't make it go back, but they're not, they're still here, so they're, mm -hmm. they're on, I guess they can't be on welfare if they're illegal, but they're on whatever they're on. They're, they're living, not, they're not contributing to the economy. But you're saying that that doesn't last. I mean, they're really, the traditional American view that at the end of the day, whatever, the second, third generations, we see no evidence that this has changed. Right. Second generation always does better. Uh, third generation, there's usually a little fall off. Right. And yeah. uh, that's because, you know, the kids of immigrants saw how much their parents sacrificed. They want to really succeed. Uh, and then they get a little complacent in the third. Now, one argument is these earlier there was no welfare state, so my grandparents, you know, they had to work extremely hard, and my parents had to work very hard. And now they can, it's so easy once you get here, especially once you get legalized, you got this cushy American welfare state, and so the same dynamic doesn't hold that used to hold. Any well, truth. Ag again, I think there's a little truth in that. I, you know, I think the welfare state, welfare, at least permanent welfare, is not good for anybody. It doesn't right. matter where you were born or what color you are. It's, you know, it's 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 a downer. Uh, however, again, there are a lot of studies about welfare participation by legal immigrants because you're right, illegal immigrants cannot participate. Um, shows that while they are poor. Uh, they are much less likely to be on welfare than comparably poor uh, mm -hmm. native-born. If they get help, they tend to get that help for shorter periods of time. They get in, you know, maybe somebody was working in one of these processing uh, plants, loses their job, so they end up getting some benefits, maybe food stamps for their kids or whatever, uh, but then they go back and they find another job. So they're in and out of the system. They tend not to be long-term recipients. Um, but I still think that there are, you know, reasons to be concerned about welfare use. Uh, I think the way to attack that is to reform the welfare system, and we've done that partially. We do now have work requirements and other things, but I don't think that uh, cutting off immigration is going to be the problem because the real uh, larger problem of, of welfare is from native-born Americans. And, you know, young immigrants who work and whose kids work help in terms of the welfare state. Right. Because well, they're contributing taxes. They can, and this is, you right. know, people think illegal immigrants don't pay taxes, but as I said, they do. They also pay a, a lot of them, particularly if they're working on Social Security numbers that are not their own, they're having taxes taken out. Right. And by the way, those taxes that are taken out for Social Security and Medicare, they're actually helping prop up the system for the over 65 crowd uh, who are beneficiaries of that. And without their contributions, you would see both Social Security and Medicare uh, reaching the, the problem of bankruptcy even sooner than it's likely to now. Yeah, Ron Brownstein makes this point. Very diverse young people are supporting undiverse older people right, right now. I <laughs> mean, just right. empirically, that's right. true. That's I true. Mean, this, that's these right. programs are not there's not really savings, it's really pay as you go. Right, that is so exactly right. So you need a lot of people to be working. What other, what other, crime? Uh, this is one of the, the biggest canards out there, uh, that somehow immigrants are leading to a crime wave. First of all, crime, uh, like illegal immigration, is down, it's not up. Uh, we are relatively more safe today than we have been in generations. I, at least a generation. Um, violent crime rate is way down. Property crime rates are, are down. Um, and 
when you look at crime committed by those who are foreign born, the foreign born, including Mexicans, uh, are much less likely to commit crimes than native born Americans. Mm -hmm. They have a lower crime rate. And in fact, there was a very interesting study out of the University of Chicago that looked at neighborhoods and what the basic finding was, if you're poor, find a neighborhood with lots and lots of immigrants and you're gonna find a safer neighborhood than with lots of comparably poor uh, American born because immigrants are self-selected, they come here to work, uh, they have families and much more likely live in two-parent households with children and not be out on the streets you know, committing mayhem. So why all the concern? I mean, I guess honestly, you know, we have, I mean, I'm in this. I agree with you. So I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but, but why are people so? If everything is basically a happy, I mean, in a way, what you're saying is, uh, yeah, immigration is a little higher than it's been legally historically. We have a certain amount of illegal immigration, sort of steady. Uh, they're assimilating pretty well. They're working pretty hard. They're not committing crimes disproportionately. They're contributing to the economy. Uh, but that's not the mood in the country. Well, that, that's, uh, I think, largely true. But, you know, what, what people, uh, people have, you know, historical amnesia. Uh, we are, we love to think of ourselves as an immigrant nation. You know, we have the Statue of Liberty is one of our prime symbols. Uh, but the fact is, we've always had a love-hate relationship with immigrants. Going back to the founding, I mean, Ben Franklin, the way he talked about Germans, you know, nobody in public life today, well, maybe Donald Trump would, but, right. but very few not people. Not about Germans, <laughs> Not about Germans, but about <laughs> Mexicans. But, you know, uh, there were very, very strong anti-German uh, sentiments uh, during, during the founding. In the middle of the 19th century, you had this influx of people from Germany uh, and Ireland. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the whole temperance movement, even prohibition, was sort of an anti-immigrant uh, mm -hmm. movement. Uh, they were concerned about the beer halls the Germans were operating. The Irish were considered to be, you know, drunkards and, and uh, you know, uh, basically not productive members of society. And so you had this whole temperance movement. Uh, and then you had prohibition, uh, which was largely driven by people who wanted to keep Germans from being able to have their, their beer halls. Um. So it's not, but it's not rational. It's, I mean, not, it's not rational. It's, you know, I, look, human nature, it, I think that we're almost genetically programmed to look for people like ourselves. I mean, going back to our, you know, earliest uh, memories as humans, uh, when we had lived in clans or tribes, uh, the outsider was a, was a threat. And yeah. so I think there is this kind of tendency uh, of people to want to be around people who look like them, talk like them, you know, have similar experiences. Um, it's not evil. It's not wrong to feel that way. Uh, what we don't tend to realize, at least initially when you're coming in contact with people who are different, is that as humans, we actually have much more in common, and people are adaptable. People change. People learn a new language. They learn a new way of life. And the thing about America is that we are such a strong idea. I mean, it is true that in Europe they don't assimilate people very well, but we do here. And um, people not only assimilate by language and economically, uh, intermarriage is very high. For uh, U.S.-born Hispanics, uh, more than half marry outside the group. Um, that, you know, took a long time for uh, many previous immigrant groups to reach that level of uh, outmarriage. So, you know, then what do you do? You, people like me. My, my mother's maiden name is McKenna. Uh, the only immigrants in my family came from Ireland. The Dolans and the McKennas came across in the 19th century. She married Rudy Chavez in New Mexico. His family went back to the early 1600s in New yeah. Mexico. I then married a Jew. Uh, my children, uh, my two married children, one married a, uh, someone whose mother was from Ecuador and father was from Cuba, but my other son married a girl who's mostly Scots-Irish. Uh, this is the story of America. We all sort of blend together. The, the melting pot is still working. And I think it always will uh, because I think the idea of America is so strong and people come here for opportunity and they, uh, they enjoy the freedoms um, that our nation provides. And I just have great confidence. I think America is an exceptional country and will continue to be no matter how many immigrants we have. I mean, I guess the sort of person who 
you know, would sympathize with some of what you're saying, but want to be skeptical, would say, well, that's it's one thing to assimilate Germans and Irish. They're all Europeans. They, the languages aren't that different. The skin color is the same, which is, I guess, important in human history. Uh, but when you have a country that goes from, I don't know, 90 percent white to, what is it, 73, 74 percent, mm-hmm. at least of the electorate, and I think among young people, closer to 50 or you know, mm-hmm. 60 or 50 percent even, uh, school age kids and so forth, that's putting more strain. That that that's too much strain. And and are we maybe the intermarriage won't be so great if there are ethnic and racial differences, uh, and maybe the cultural gar- barriers are greater. Maybe Mexicans isn't that great, but certainly Somalis and you know mm-hmm. others from other parts of the world. That really is a stretch. And I don't know. I mean, this, what's your answer? But I mean. Well, um, there's, look. There's data on this, I suppose. There is and, data, and but also we have to, again, you know, with this myopia we have about the past, um, all those Italians and Jews and Southern Eastern Europeans that were coming, they were not embraced as fellow Europeans. Yeah, they didn't seem quite, right. as, no, they didn't seem quite funny, as white. It is funny because when right. people say today, you know, well, it's amazing, and it gone from 90%, yeah. know, this year you see this in a political context, mm-hmm. the electorate was 90%. Mm-hmm. Uh, white mm-hmm. in, I don't know, 1980, maybe when Reagan won or something like that, or 88, and now it's, I think, 73, 74%. Right. Percent, and that's an amazing pace of change. But I'm sure if one just substitute WASP or Protestant right. or right. Yeah, you and, know, and English and German for, for the for the first number and then starts adding in the Italians, the Jews, right. Right. You know, Russians, et cetera, it, right. it's it, hard it, to know that the pace of change wouldn't have been as great. It probably was as great, actually, for yeah, a lot of American and, and what, you know, this whole... Uh, the, counting by by race and ethnicity. This is driven, I think, in large part by the whole push for affirmative action. And, and, and again, it goes back to the multicultural uh, attitude that the left had at one point. They wanted to keep people separate. So they would count my grandchildren with their red hair and green eyes and very fair skin, can't be out in the sun at all, as Hispanic because it would boost the numbers and, you know, make for more... Uh, uh, viable political uh, movement that they could call their own. Um, but in fact, because of intermarriage and because of the assimilative process, um, I, I don't think that really is relevant. And this again, this whole notion of white, white is a very amorphous concept. And while it's true Mexico, uh, the population there is a hybrid, uh, it is uh, indigenous, uh, it's African, uh, and it's European. Right. Um, so, you know, it's it's not, um, in, in some ways, I mean, you know, people objected to the concept of La Raza because it sounded, oh, the race, this sounds very sort of racist. Well, in fact, La Raza was this hybrid combination. Um, and whether Mexicans will, you know, they, they do seem to be intermarrying, um, and and they probably are, you know, whether they're becoming lighter or, you know, the Scotch, Irish, and, and uh, Germans are becoming darker, I don't know. We're all sort of getting more, you know, we are sort of blending. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess it, when you think about it, I mean, was there a race that was more distinct and to which more hostility was uh, demonstrated apart from African Americans? black Americans uh, than the Japanese and the Chinese were both in terms of war with the Japanese and the internment camps. Of course, the Chinese. I mean, that's where immigration. Real real discrimination and real immigration camps. And now, look, does anyone think there's a big problem of, yeah, you know, too many Chinese Asians. separation well, actually, or yes. Japanese Harvard separation? Well, actually, Harvard University thinks there's a problem with well, too many right, Asians. Well, right, because they're too successful. <laughs> because they're right. too successful. Uh, but and you're there's right. There's also very high intermarriage, which I think one wouldn't have said right. at one point because they seem to talk about different cultures, racially right? Di- right? Well, racially, racially different culturally, and culturally not different, Christian right. and not Western. Languages have no, right. you know, I mean, Spanish is a lot closer to English than Chinese or Japanese right. is. Uh, no, but you're absolutely right. And the first um, immigration restriction laws were passed to keep the Asians out, to keep the Chinese out primarily. Uh, that was the beginning of the idea of restricting immigration to America. Prior to that, you know, you got here anyway by hook or crook, uh, crossed over, put your foot on American land, and you began the process to becoming an American. You know, we've had different uh Eras had different level uh, lengths that you had to be in the United States uh, residing here to, to, become, to, a to become a citizen. But is that right? So really, before whatever that was, Chinese eighteen eighty-two, you just showed up. You showed up, yeah. Just and the you, way the did you register? I guess you did. Actually, I mean, Probably it depended. Not. It was uh, no. Um, by no. and large, uh, what what happened is when the law was five years for naturalization, you'd go to. 
Uh, it could be a justice of the peace, but some officer of the court. You'd bring a couple of your buddies to attest that you were of good moral character, and you'd swear your allegiance to become a U.S. citizen. It was a pre- pretty easy process. I guess Ellis Island, in that respect, was already a later. It was later. Ellis Island you came had after to that. Show that you were going to be a. a you, you weren't. You, you weren't you, right. You were not a pauper. You didn't have a communicable disease. Right, right. Uh, you weren't an anarchist or whatever. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's interesting about the Chinese and Japanese. People really forget about that. And it also does suggest that the, just the pure, I mean, whatever the foolishness of different government policies and, mm-hmm. we, you know, bilingual education or, or excessive focus on ethnicity and schools and, you know, fool, various forms of fool, multiculturalism, the pure power, I suppose, of the popular culture combined with, uh, towards assimilation, combined really just with intermarriage probably right. just swamps the, that. Is that your sense? I mean, I, It is my sense. And, you know, it's interesting you mentioned bilingual education because everybody thinks of, you know, the court decisions and other things that led to this massive move towards teaching kids in their native language came because of Hispanics. No, it came because of a Chinese boy uh, in San Francisco. And it was uh, the Lao decision uh, that that uh, prompted uh, the federal government to begin saying, well, we have to teach these kids in their native language, give them a period of time to adjust. I think by the time that, I think his name was Kenny Lau, uh, his case got to the Supreme Court, my guess is he was, you know, perfectly fluent in English, probably had forgotten all the Chinese that they were trying to teach him um, because that's what happens. And people don't want to hold on to the past. Young people want to be part of the future. They want to belong. They want to fit in. Uh, They're not going to be trying to behave as they would, you know, in San Salvador or in Mexico City. They want to behave like they are in Los Angeles or New York or wherever, Chicago. Um, uh, Yeah, when I I was at the education department and we worked on some of these issues together or at least Mm -hmm. in parallel, I'd say, yeah, we we fought against the federal, at that time, I think it was only federal funding for bilingual education. Mm not for ESL, for English as a second language, or assimilation. I think we worked actually with a liberal Democrat, Claiborne Pell, to try to make different programs equally eligible for, for these funds, as long as they taught kids, you know, uh, uh, in adequate ways. And my sense is, I haven't looked at this, though, in a long time, that there's actually less strict bilingual education now right. in the schools and more English as a second language. They, I mean, even the multicultural left or the diversity left is to, uh, understands that you got to teach these kids English if they're going to have a good Absolutely. Chance. You know, I was head of the migrant, uh, the Commission on Migrant Education back uh, in the 1990s, I guess it was, late 1990s. And we went out and held field hearings around the country, uh, hearing from parents, immigrant parents, who wanted their kids to learn English. And at the time, California really pushed to teach kids in their native language. And one of our most dramatic hearings was of a woman from Mexico who was an indigenous um, person, and she spoke a language related to Mayan, came and testified before us. We had to have a translator for her. And she was complaining because the schools in California were doing something that the Mexican government had tried for 500 years to do, and that is to force the Mayans to speak Spanish. Uh, And they'd not succeeded, but the California Los Angeles School District was in fact insisting that her child be taught Spanish before they he could learn English, which was insane. I mean, you know, if, you're, if your ultimate goal is English, why would you force the child to learn yet another second language before English? But most of that has gone by the wayside, uh, in part, I think, because of uh, the push from immigrant parents. They've been unwilling to have their kids stuck in these segregated programs where they're going to be taught a language that's not going to help them move up the economic ladder. The parents may be, you know, cleaning bathrooms at night. They don't want their kids to be doing that job. They want their kids to be working in the front office. And they know that they have to learn English if they're going to do that. I want to come back and ask you about actual immigration reform. I mean, uh, what we should be doing. But I guess two more questions. When you hear diversity, I mean, how much is that the old multiculturalism repackaged? How much of it is legitimate? How do you worry that there's so much talk? It's become such a sort of talking point, and you it, know. it has. And and you know the whole idea of diversity came out of the Baki decision in the 1970s on affirmative action, and uh, it was decided that you couldn't. Uh, 
give preference uh, to certain groups in order to overcome the effects of past discrimination, which frankly had more appeal to me than the idea of promoting diversity. Uh, that whole thing is, is to me so fundamentally racist. Again, it sort of assumes that because of the color of your skin or where your parents came from or what language they came speaking that you're somehow different. Um, and I just think that's uh, a wrong-headed notion. And you're right. I think the the term diversity has replaced multiculturalism or bilingualism or some of the other, um, you know, words from the past. But it's um, it's every bit I think as problematic as as those previous movements. But you don't think in the real world of America in 2018 it's doing too much to slow down what you've described as the normal kind of assimilation and uh, I don't think it really is. I mean, I think that its proponents would like it. And, and I mean, I, you know, because I spent some time in corporate America, there's a lot of push for diversity in corporate America. Um, I, I'd rather have the notion of equal opportunity. Right. You know, come in, prove yourself. Uh, doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter what your background is, what you know, your gender is, what your color is. Um, just come in and do the job and do a good job and and succeed, um, and make sure that the door is not closed to people because of those uh, kinds of extraneous factors. Uh, that to me is better than saying, well, we want a certain number of this and a certain number of that. We want to have balance. Uh, again, if that kind of social planning is never worked. Um, the market works, um, that kind of en social engineering doesn't. Yeah. And what about, I guess, Muslims, since Trump talked about it, I mean, that was the Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. Muslim Americans or Muslim immigrants or refugees uh, uh, or people, see, people seeking, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Refugee status. Refugee right? status yeah. here and... Uh, right, asylum. Uh, asylum, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, is. Are there a ton of them? Is it a big problem? Are they doing okay? Is, is there something more Europe? It, sound, it seems a little more, a little scarier and more European-like right. than. Well, in, in because of 9/11, uh, people are more worried about the idea that people may be coming here to do us harm and that they're maybe taking advantage of our very liberal notions of you know welcoming people uh, to get here and do bad things. So. Um, <sighs> The one thing about assimilation is assimilation works pretty well along racial and ethnic lines. It's not as successful along religi religious lines. I mean, you still have the Amish uh, who don't speak English uh, in their communities. Uh, you still have ascetic Jews um, who don't speak English in their communities, uh, though they may know English. That's not their preferred language. Uh, and you now have Muslims who um, may not integrate as well either. And so religion is more tenacious. Uh, but overall, if you look again at the statistics, overall, the Muslim population is doing well. They're doing very well in education. They're doing well economically. Um, whether or not there's cause for concern about a kind of um, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, people who have an Islamist uh, orientation, I think that's, you know, that bears watching. Um, but it does not, it should not, in my view, be the controlling factor in our asylum or refugee policy. Um, I was not happy with the, the Muslim ban. Um, I think there um, are good reasons for the United States to continue to accept refugees and asylees. Uh, yes, they have to be properly vetted. Yes, we should try to promote assimilation once they're here. Um, but to close our doors when you have one of the wor world's worst refugee crises going on, it's the worst refugee crisis going on in the world right now since World War II. And for America to shut our doors, I, it's just not American to me. Yeah. So what should, what should our actual policy be? I mean, it, let's, the system everyone seems to agree is kind of broken. Legal immigration takes a long time for people. Some people you'd want to stay here, can't be able to, aren't allowed to stay here. People are here illegally, kids who, people who came as kids are now 23 years old and uncertain about their status. It does seem like it's not a reasonable, it's not optimal. We could probably muddle no. through with the current system, but. 
So what kind of reform should we be looking at? Well, uh, first of all, with respect to the DACA kids, uh, we ought to legalize their status, and they ought to be able to be set on the path to citizenship. I think that, to me, is non-negotiable. Just do it. Yeah, un- just do it. Just get it done. Just do it. They've lived here. They're, the right. data they're shows as American they're, as you or I. And, and they're doing fine. Right. Right. And they're doing fine. They're working. They're going to school. They're serving in the military. Um, we ought to do that. Um, in terms of what our legal immigration policies ought to be, I think we ought to have a mix. The current system is almost entirely based on family reunification. If you have a close order relative who's already here, you've got a leg up in terms of coming because that person can sponsor you if they're a resident, uh, permanent resident, or if they're a citizen, they can sponsor you. And we interpret family very broadly. It includes uh, adult parents, uh, adult children, uh, brothers and sisters. There's a there's um, you know declining preference the farther you get out in terms of the family. But um, that's been virtually our whole system. We have very few number of visas that we give for skills. I think there ought to be more balance. I think we need, still need family reunification um, because a lot of the people who come here have skills too. Um, but I also think we ought to have a more skills-based system, that skills ought to be our first priority. And we need two kinds of people in terms of skills. We need people with uh, scientific, uh, engineering, computer, math, the whole sort of STEM um, background. Uh, we're, we're not producing enough of, of those of our own, so we need people at the top level. But we also need the people to work on the poultry processing line to pick our fruits and vegetables, etc. Now, whether those people come per Permanently, or whether they come on long-term uh, work visas um, and have to go back at a certain period, uh, that I think is perfectly debatable. I think we ought to have that argument. We ought to have that debate. Um, but I don't think we want a system where we have the government deciding how many people we need in a year. Government's not good at doing that. Employers are pretty good. They know how many people they need. So it ought to be something that is flexible when we have high unemployment, um, when wages are stagnant, maybe you let in fewer. But when the economy is booming, you let in more. Um, I mean, I think it has to be, the free market has to weigh in. You have to come up with a system that allows um, flexibility. And that if we were to do that, um, I think we could largely eliminate the, the push uh, factor in terms of illegal immigration. And overall numbers, you'd be okay with the current numbers? You know, in, when the economy was booming, um, you know, around you know, 2000, uh, when we had the most number of people trying to sneak in illegally, uh, there were about a million and a half people who were you know, apprehended trying to sneak in. That was probably the market number that was right then. When you've got an economy that's been sluggish for the last you know, eight years, it's picking up. But now um, you got three or 400,000 coming in. Let the economy. But we have like economy. about what a one and a half. We have about a we, right. We have about uh, one, one million, million coming in legally. legally. And, yeah, and um, yeah, we probably need a little bit more. I would say. I I, I think you know uh, if if you took the legal number and the illegal number and combined them and gave away for people to come legally who are now coming uh, forced to come illegally because they have no alternative, um, you'd probably hit the right number. And would you do country quotas or ceilings or just do it more in terms of Well, we do have country quotas now. Uh, I think qualifications are the most important. Um, you know, we have about half of all immigrants now are from Latin America, a little over a quarter are from Asia, and then the rest of the world uh, takes up the rest. Um, so it is dominated by Latin Americans. Um, I don't know that that will continue to be the case. If you see what's happening in places like Nicaragua and Venezuela, there's going to be a lot of push for people to leave those countries. Uh, be great to have more uh, middle-class Venezuelans coming, you know, who have no opportunity there. Uh, and the same, you know, in Nicaragua. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't see any problems. I don't know that we want to have country uh, limitations. I, you know, I just, again, I, I'm. I've got some libertarian streak that says government's just not good at deciding these things. Let the market do it. That seems a little weird. I mean, I guess it's historically been the case that we've had country right. caps and quotas, really. Right. I mean, but it does seem a little odd to sit around Washington deciding yeah. Yeah, this I mean, country what gets 5,000 and this right. country gets yeah, 8, or even Congress. I mean, then it yeah. just becomes, uh, you Then know, it becomes a political issue right. that's in Congress, right? Right. Um, but you would have more skill 
I would have more. I look. I agree that the expelling the PhD is not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people. Right. We educate these people and then we send them home. What you know? Why not? We and and even if they've gone to, you know, private institutions, a lot of public money that goes into education, and so we're helping to pay for their education, even if they're paying their tuition. Uh, So why not take the benefit of that? I, I. see no reason why we shouldn't be giving green cards. You know, you get uh, a degree in computer engineering from Stanford, get a green card with that a diploma. And you would then want to let them have a path to citizenship. I absolutely. You don't would. want to have. I don't want to have permanent. A, no, residence. I don't want. I don't want to turn into the old Germany where, or the old Russia, where you could have lived for generations. The Turk, uh, Turks who lived in Germany could be there multi generations, never could become German citizens. The, the Germans in Russia couldn't become citizens. No, I think. Uh, the whole idea of America is we want people to become American. We do not want people uh, to be kept outside the fold. I think that's a recipe for disaster. Well, I did a conversation like this with Ed Conard, who made very strongly, the, uh, it, you know, what could you do for the economy? And of course, there are a lot of things mm-hmm. that one could do from tax policy to regulation to education. But he was very strong, and people can listen to the conversation or read the transcript and, and, and see the more. The, more, the nuances of his argument, but on immigration. I mean, that actually, mm-hmm. if you just want a wealthier country, a more productive country, a more innovative country, mm-hmm. to keep our edge mm-hmm. in certain uh, areas on the rest of the world, immigration, especially the right kind of immigration, he's thinking a little more high skilled, mm-hmm. though not entirely, sure. of course, because a lot of the kids of unskilled immigrants become high, highly high skilled, skilled right. you know, graduates of MIT. But nonetheless, um, he said that's just one of the key things. I mean, absolutely. The, but it's striking, isn't it, how people regard it, even in on the sort of more liberal, let's call it, side of the debate. It's sort of a burden that we should, or we, we owe it to people. We shouldn't be cruel or mean. So let's let an X number, or let's defend, let's I don't know, normalize the status of the DACA uh, kids. But it's funny how little it seems to me people see it as an opportunity and as a, right. a part of really, as you said, American greatness. I mean, right. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, I've always made the case that, you know, it's fine that this is good for immigrants, but that's not why I'm pushing it. I'm pushing it because it's good for America, uh, because it's in our interests. It's in our economic interests. Um, I do think being that beacon, uh, being the place where people who are up and comers want to come and make their fortunes uh, is good. You know, I look back of of the economy of the last uh, decade or so, look back to the housing crisis. We could have solved the housing crisis overnight when we had that glut of overpriced real estate. If we had allowed people to come who would guarantee them to buy a house and hold it for X number of years, uh, you would have had a lot of uh, wealthy Asians coming who would have bought up those houses. We could have had uh, the economy propped up by that. Uh, and yet we never think of those things. We never think of using uh, our you know, magnet uh, as an immigrant uh, you know, country um, as something that we can use to benefit us economically. I guess we, use, we think of the magnet as a drawing in a lot of questionable or right. disreputable That's what we like characters to, it, to right. our, you know, right. uh, as opposed to, you know, a real opportunity for us. You know. What prospects do you think that we'll have a healthier discussion and debate on immigration? I think a lot of it depends on what happens um, in the 2018 elections. I think the Trump administration is doing its uh, level best to limit legal immigration, to cut back on the number of people who who, uh, are allowed in permanently, to even take people who have visas and uh, limit their ability to use those visas. We have some recent incidents where uh, people have their visas pulled. at you know, at an entry point, um, because they were you know deemed as, as possibly you know not uh, not wanting to leave. Um, we've got uh, people who become naturalized citizens. Uh, the administration is going through and checking to make sure that they didn't you know uh, misrepresent uh, why they came to the United States. So they're losing their their right to be citizens. It used to be you know ex Nazis that we would hunt down. You know, now we're hunting down people who, you know, have not committed heinous crimes against humanity, uh, but may have had a DUI uh, or, you know, may have smoked pot when they were in college or whatever uh, and denaturalize them. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think the prospects in the near term are not good for any kind of immigration uh, reform, but I think that, um, I think we will see a shift. I mean, the pendulum does seem to go back and forth on the immigration issue. And 
I think that uh, as people realize that the people who are here are becoming Americans as they, you know, their kids start doing well, um, I think you'll start to see that pendulum shift back towards the middle. Why did it shift so much the other way, do you think? Is it just the accidents of certain political fights or? Uh, uh, I think there was so much anxiety about the economy, I guess that uh, was particularly good... among lower class whites, and, and anxiety about the culture. I mean, they, you know, they're the people who get most irritated at the press one for English. Um, I recently, you know, saw a friend of mine in Boulder who's a working class guy, and he was talking, been down at the VFW the night before, and he was talking about a friend of his who, who used to be a drywall hanger, complaining about the Mexicans who came in and stole his job. And I said, well, wait a second. You know, why didn't he put together a crew of those Mexicans and he becomes the, the person who's out there, you know, contracting for the jobs? And, you know, there was no answer to that. Um, in fact, having these low-wage workers can, al can actually lift, and, and again, the economic data shows that, they can actually lift um, whites uh, who've, uh, who may have lost their jobs hanging drywall but can start their own drywall company now with the, with the advantage of this uh, lower play, uh, lower uh, priced uh, laborers. But it is, if you're in that position, um, if you don't have the initiative, the wherewithal, if you've got, you know, other kinds of problems, the opioid crisis, you know, that's inflicting many of these communities, um, it's, you know, you want to blame somebody. And so it's easy to blame somebody who stole your job. I suppose you're most affected, perhaps, if by certain aspects, the less pleasant or more difficult aspects of immigration uh, don't affect you know, upper middle class people right. on the coast that much. So that's right. It's a kind of react. Though on the other hand, I've seen some of the studies that show that the people who are most vociferous about immigration and illegal immigration don't actually live near. They don't. Right. They don't know any immigrants, so it's very easy. Look, and and mass media. Um, you know, if you if you watch Fox News twenty four hours a day and you see all these pictures of people climbing over the the walls that exist, or you know, crossing the river and sneaking in, and they look sort of you know shady and it's dark and. You know, they look like, uh, you know, they've been on the road for a while and, and they look scary and different. Um, you know, if that's your view, if that's where you're getting your information from, you're not going to have a very, you know, friendly attitude. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's states with low immigration levels that seem to be most anti-immigrant, not, you know, not the Texas or California or New York, uh, but, you know, places uh, where there aren't a whole lot of people that, you know, people get to know firsthand. I guess I do think, don't you think in 2015, especially though with the Trump campaign picking up steam, I think the European crisis really had a big effect. Probably. You couldn't watch Fox without seeing, mm -hmm. and they were terrible. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, it was a terrible problem, hundreds of thousands of them, and Angela Merkel probably mis foolishly, perhaps in retrospect, or maybe at the time it was obvious that it was a mistake, sort of to seem to want to welcome them all, and then, you know, of a crisis of where to who in Europe would take all these migrants and but you know uh, there is a and big then a couple of terror attacks in Nice right. and then here San Bernardino it all did seem like a perfect storm to right. whip up uh, it did and and Trump played into that but you know there is a big difference between a refugee and an immigrant immigrants are people who basically have put aside some money I mean now if they're coming in illegally they have to pay thousands of dollars to a coyote uh, smuggler uh, to bring them across the border. So they're people who have planning. I mean, th that's one of the things about, you know, immigrants is that they're self-selected. These are entrepreneurial people with initiative, people who are willing to take risks. Refugees, on the other hand, are people who get pushed out of their country, as in Syria. You know, when, you're, when, when your city is being bombed, uh, when women are being raped and, uh, and people are, you know, being having their heads chopped off, uh, you have to get out of there quickly. And it's a very different population than immigrants who, as I say, are more forward-looking, uh, have planned, and tend to be not the poorest of the poor, but at least one level, sometimes two or three levels up. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that distinction is not, I'm sure it's made in the professional, you know, among professional immigration lawyers and, and uh, experts, but, but in the public, I think mm -hmm. it's all, that's sort of all. Yeah, everybody uh, thinks it's all one big mass And, and Trump, program. don't you think, really does 
merge them together. Well, Trump really does. And and there's such, I mean, you know, I watched as, uh, as uh, our first lady's uh, parents got naturalized and became American right. citizens. Trump, who rails against chain migration, we shouldn't be allowing people to bring their adult parents. Oh, except for my in-laws. <laughs> and they get well, you had an eloquent piece. I think I, I quoted this somewhere in defense of I don't know, called exactly this, but in defense of chain migration, which has become yeah. such a, yeah. a bogeyman sort of a uh, bogeyman, and uh, and even where maybe we should have more merit-based immigration, but I mean, do people really not want their are their parents going to really be public burdens right. on the public? Your typical right. uh, immigrant who's legalized in the 30s, 40s, 50s, it's probably pretty harmless at least to bring the parents over, yeah, and, and brothers and sisters probably do pretty well. I would I'm just and, guessing, the, and that's right? the way uh, the brothers and sisters of current legal immigrants probably yeah. end up. Doing well. Doing right. okay, you know. Yeah, and, I mean, and, uh, and that is the way it's always been. I mean, you know, when my Irish immigrant uh, ancestors came, you know, it was usually a male who came first, and then he sent for his brothers and sisters and sometimes his parents, and then they all came and did pretty well. In my, in my case, they ended up in Iowa, you know, farmers, the next generation. My great uncle ended up, you know, being a professor at Marquette University. Uh, and these were from dirt farmers who and were. Some went back, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Some went back, right? But this is the history. I mean, um, you know, when you look at Jews in the early 20th century, uh, my husband's uh, uh, grandparents, I mean, they came and then they sent for others. They came and established, got a job, started saving, and sent for others. That's the way it's always been. And it is. I mean, it makes sense to limit it in certain ways, obviously. And yeah, it doesn't have to be 100%. Stuff, right, you know. yeah. But I don't right. think it is really as much as people think. Right? No, it isn't. I mean, the, you know, it's it really is. It's really children and parents. Right, it's really children and parents. And some uh, brothers and sisters come, you know, farther down the line. And again, because there are those country quotas, et cetera, it's not all that easy to bring your whole family. Right, I know people who are waiting actually a long right. time. Legal, totally legal. legal. Right. Waited in line, immigrants right. from Europe or something, and then right. they try to get someone else in. It takes them. I mean, Europe, years. you're having well, less long took of a wait. Mrs. Trump, you're, honestly, if you think about it, she's been here a long time, and yeah. I assume she might have tried to. Well, but Europe, had, the waits are less long because right. there are less Europeans that want to come here than there are, you know, Chinese, Indians, and Mexicans. So you're not pessimistic about this either immigration itself doing great damage to the country or the issue of immigration doing damage to our great damage to our civic discourse and politics. Well, I, I think, think the whole backlash against the uh, the children who were taken from their parents, I think that sort of was a wake-up call from people. When you, mm. you had the Trump administration with a zero-tolerance policy, and by the way, some of those families were legitimate asylee. You know, they were looking for uh, asylum. Um, and to see them separated, to see the incompetence of government unable to even match parents with their children, um, I think that was a wake-up call for people who, you know, were not viscerally anti-immigrant and thought, well, maybe this isn't the right thing. So I think, um, I think that, uh, I think the administration overplayed its hand there, as, as I think they will if they try to push uh, a, a ban on birthright citizenship. I think that that will be a bridge too far for most Americans. And so, you know, again, this country has always been a kind of moderate country. We never swing too far to the right or too far to the left. Uh, Trump has taken us farther than I would have ever have imagined on this issue. But I still have faith in the American people. And when you look at polling data, most Americans are happy to give the DACA kids citizenship. Most Americans think that, you know, if you're born here, you're an American. Um, so I, I think it will, it will level out when you no longer have a demagogue out there pushing it. Oh, that's a good, a good note to end on. We'll see how soon that is, but uh, <laughs> hopefully sooner rather than later. I'll say speaking for myself, not for you there, <laughs> not to politicize these conversations. Linda Chavez, thanks so much for joining me today, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.